interested in religion. He was interested in how you can approach God. And in the human approach to God, it's not just something that's interesting from way back then, it's interesting now because we still fight the same battles. We're not talking about Christianity, we're talking about Christ. And, and that's what it became, a system of behavior. If you did these things, you were in good shape with God. So it became one long drudgery of endless, lifeless duties for the most part. Now that's kind of what religion is, but Jesus said that's not what spiritual life is. Let's not get it wrong, because he's a revolutionary doesn't mean that he discounted everything that came along. He came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So the question would be, when he said fulfill it, what did he really mean? In that original Greek, there's this really cool little meaning that, that I found as I was, was looking into this word. Fulfilling that original meaning also meant to um, level up a hollow. Use your imagination for a second. If you have a driveway like mine, you don't even have to use your imagination. Imagine you get a pothole in your driveway. So you go out and you buy that nice expensive filler asphalt stuff and you, come and you put a bunch of it in. And, and uh, if uh, it happens like it usually does, it looks really good at first and then what happens? The darn stuff sinks, doesn't it? And you end up with a hollow. And so even though your driveway's almost fixed, it's still a pain because you're still as you're going in. There's a hollow that needs to be leveled up. In the spiritual sense, that was true. God gave a law to his people, but there was a hollow that needed filling up. Nicodemus was that really well-accomplished, high up there priest on the Sanhedrin and all of that stuff. And yet, he had such a nagging hollowness still. There was still something not finished in all his understanding of the law. There was still something that wasn't finished. And it bothered him so much that he risked in the middle of the night going out to meet this rogue rabbi and ask him, just to ask him, we know that you must be from God. So tell me, what am I missing? And Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he's saying, you know, the problem isn't, isn't in your duty. It's not in your knowledge. The problem for you and for everyone else who's following this religion is this. You're not missing anything but a person. You are missing a presence. You are missing a relationship. That's what completes this. You know what the Old Testament is? It's a 4,000 year lesson on why we need a Messiah. It's no wonder people that can, in our day can look at you wide-eyed when you talk about Jesus. I don't blame you. It, it took humanity 4,000 years to understand what's going on. But Jesus was telling him, and he uses this odd phrase, he says, you must be born again. What is that? And he explains in the same way that, that a woman has a baby, there's a seed implanted in her, and, and, and it grows and it becomes this person. In that same way, God himself must be within, and then he grows within you. There is a presence, a personhood, there is a relationship that develops. A relationship. And so the law leads to being born again. How do you experience your faith? Whatever you believe, and everybody believes something. How do you experience it? Here's the thing. Really, a relationship with God cannot be, cannot be, and just in case you didn't hear me, cannot be an outward in thing. It must be inward and go out, not outward and go inward. You are the salt of the world. Really? Yeah, you. You are the salt of the world. Well, good for me. Ah, here's a warning, though, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? How do you resalt salt? It is then, and catch these words, good for nothing. Good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. Matthew 5.13. You do not go out and do salt. You are salt. It's telling you that this inner thing is the gateway to everything else.
Jesus simply took everything that people thought they knew and turned it on its ear. It's not outward in, it's inward out. It is not religion, it's, it's, um, it is relationship. All of these things, just turn it upside down, and I dare say this is in this mystery of things we're talking about. If you're starting to get it, if a relationship is actually starting to happen, this will happen to you. Everything you thought you knew will get turned upside down. Will get turned upside down. I told you that this relationship thing had to happen, but the most revolutionary thing of all is how Jesus says it has to happen. It's a, a dramatic scene unfolds. Jesus is teaching in a synagogue, kind of like this. The hood of up front begins talking. And unlike uh, what I'm saying, he says something they've never heard before. And his words, it's in John 6.53 is where it starts. And Jesus says this to all of them. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What is he saying here? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Do you know that eating is really, for physical beings, is one of the most intimate things we do. Now, when I say intimate, not necessarily loving, although a lot of us, we love to eat, but in a way that it is that personal. What happens when you eat something? You have consumed something. It is part of you, like it or not. Jesus says, take this and put it into a spiritual context. The idea, the mystery of how this works is you have to, in the same way, consume God and make Him part of you. And in becoming part of you, you are part of Him. Consume God in what way? Well, you consume Him in the teachings you know. You consume Him by living up to what you know. Everybody in here knows something. Because you knew enough to at least come here. So do you live up to what you know? You consume Him in your prayer. You consume Him when you think of Him. You consume Him when you obey Him. All of these things are how we do it. It is part of you if you consume it. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How does that happen? Because somehow God being God, even though he is infinite, became a person just like us. And in becoming a person just like us, he made himself a bridge between what was infinite and what was finite. Still can't understand it, me either. I don't know how you make all of this fit together. But he did. And because he did that, we see a God who physically walked among us, and we at least see enough to wrap our minds around what it looks like to see perfection. And then uh, he offers us a way to take that and put it inside. A revolutionary idea, if we just understood that, it starts inside and works out. And, and it's a funny, funny thing if you get in this living relationship and start learning the skill of listening to God. It's amazing, once you start listening, how much more you hear. And it's amazing if you put it off, how quickly you stop hearing anything at all. Don't settle for anything less than a living relationship, because that is the revolution. There's a hollow that needs to be leveled up. That's what completes this.